And all right, let's go back to the book of Ephesians chapter number 6. I want us to look at verses 10 through 12. The Bible says here, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Father, we thank you again for these scriptures that remind us of those things that we need to do. And I pray that you'll help us to do what we need to do to combat our enemy. And uh, this evening, as we, for just a few moments, begin to try to identify our enemy, make us mindful of who our enemy is, and then give us the strategies that we need as Christians to overcome. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I do want to bring to you a thought that I've titled, Identifying Your Enemy identifying your enemy. Now listen to me. As we begin to think about identifying our enemy, knowing your opponent or enemy is one of the greatest secrets to victory on the playing field or even on a battlefield. Now, coaches and generals Many times they'll spend hours studying their opponents, studying game plans, studying battle plans. Now, one of the most important things that you and I can do as children of God is to study the game plan, to study the battle plan. This is our game plan. This Bible that I hold in, I, in my hand. This is our battle plan. This Bible that I hold in my hand. So the study of scripture is the best way for the child of God to learn who their enemy is and to learn the ways of Satan. Now listen to me. It is important that you understand that Satan is wicked. He is the wicked one who shoots all kinds of fiery darts at children of God. So I want us to, for just a few moments, get a glimpse of who we are at war with. I titled this series, The Importance of Knowing Your Enemy, and uh, we'll continue that theme even in the study of the armor itself. Now, it is so important for you to know a little bit about your enemy. So I want to share with you just a few things that the Bible has to say about the enemy, about his character. And uh, now we don't have time to turn to all of the scriptures that I'm going to give you this evening. But I'm going to give you a few scriptures and you can go home and you can look them up for those of you who are taking notes. Uh, I'll try not to move so quickly that you do not get to write these down. But the first thing that I want you to learn this evening is Satan has a personality. Did you know that? The devil has a personality. All of you, you have a personality. Now, sometimes our personality is really good, and sometimes our personality can be not so good. Uh, I've had people to say to me that you're quite the character, and uh, I don't know how to take that sometimes. I don't know whether to take that as being good or bad, but uh, I can be a character, and I I, I kind of like being that character from time to time. I enjoy laughing. Uh, the Bible says a merry heart doeth good, like a medicine. 
And uh, I believe that. And uh, I've had people to tell me sometimes that I carry on a little bit too much. Uh, and I always go back to that scripture and I remind them that they just need a good dose of a merry heart. And, and uh, I just can't help that. But we all have a personality. Uh, my dad had a very quiet personality. Uh, my oldest son is tempered a lot like my, my daddy was. He, he's kind of quiet and has a kind of a dry sense of humor. I've never had a dry sense of humor. Uh, I'm a lot like my granddaddy. My granddaddy enjoyed life and he enjoyed laughing. And uh, my brother's more like my granddaddy than I am. So, I mean, that's just our personality. And we all have a personality. Well, I want you to know the enemy has got a personality. Now, the scripture teaches us that the devil is given many names. Many names. So I want us to look at a few of these names because it basically reveals to us the personality of the devil. Now, in uh, 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse number 8, the Bible calls him your adversary. Your adversary. Your adversary, Satan, like a roaring lion, walketh about seeking those in whom he may devour. And I've learned that he'll devour his own to get to you. Uh, so you have an adversary. Uh, the second thing that I want you to see is found in Revelation chapter 12, verse number 10. And there the Bible calls the devil the accuser of the brethren. He is the accuser of the brethren. Friends, he'll accuse you whether you're guilty or not. He'll do his best to make you look guilty. So he is the accuser of the brethren. And he'll accuse you sisters too. I want you to know that. So he is the accuser. Now the third thing that I want you to see in a name that's given to him is found in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 verse number 14 and there He's called the angel of light. And there have been so many times that you thought he had a pitchfork and that he was red in color, had horns. You see, the Bible says that he is an angel of light. And what does an angel of light do? He glows and shines brightly. Uh, and so what you need to understand is as an angel of light, uh, we'll probably touch on this one a little bit later, but he is a deceiver. So he is an angel of light. And I said we'd touch on it. Well, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, he's called the deceiver. He's called the deceiver. He is a master at deception. He can take the color blue and make you think that it's purple. I'm just kidding when I said that, but he'll do his best to do that. He is good at deceiving you. He'll try to take something that's wrong and twist it and make you think that it's all right. I see a lot of that going on in our society today. We are living in a time whenever... What's wrong appears to be right, and what right appears to be wrong in the eyes of some. But let me tell you something. Wrong is wrong in the eyes of God, and right is right in the eyes of God. Amen. So Satan is a deceiver. Now, in Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, Satan is called the destroyer. The destroyer. Uh, he has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Jesus said that. He said, but I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So he is the destroyer. Now in John 17, verse number 15, the devil is called the evil one. 
the evil one. And there's nothing good about him. All that he is or ever will be is pure evil. Purity of evil. There is no more purity of evil than the devil. Uh, so he is the evil one. Now in John chapter 8, verse number 44, he is called the liar. The liar. And he is a liar. And if you're not careful, he'll have you believing a lie. He'll have you believing a lie. He's called the liar. In John 8, 44, he's not only called the liar, but he's basically called the murderer. He is the murderer. He comes to steal, to kill. Now, if you kill premeditatedly, you are a murderer. He comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Uh, in John chapter 12, verse number 31, he's called the prince. He's called the prince. Now, in Genesis chapter 4, verse number 3, as well as in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 2, he's called the serpent. The serpent. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like serpents. Amen. None of them. Now, I was pastoring a little small church a number of years ago in Tifton, Georgia. Way out in the country. And I drove up one morning and I saw the biggest, longest serpent that I ever saw in my life. And I'd already revved up the engine. Wow, Boy, I was going to get him. I read back, boy, and I was fixing to stomp the gas, and I was going to run over him. And one of my deacons ran out, Oh, preacher, no, don't run over that snake. That's a king snake. I said, I don't see nothing but the devil. <laughs> because the snake is a serpent. I don't like snakes. I don't care what kind they are. But I have learned that there are some that are considered good snakes that will take care of the evil snakes. And so I try to be very careful with those. Uh, whenever I was serving as the associate pastor of First Baptist, I may have been interim pastor then, my little wife called me one day and says, Come home quick! There's a snake wrapped around a pole. He's after the birds that come by our feeder. So I got home, and there he was, wrapped around the little pole that our bird feeder's on with his head drawn back, just waiting for some little sparrow or a little bird to stop by to eat him a little feed. And that snake was going to have him some food too. I didn't handle him. I don't handle snakes. Whether they be good or bad, I don't handle them. I went and got my little thing that I pick up pine cones with. And I got him with that thing and I unwrapped him. And I chunked him out in the woods. And guess what? The next day he was back again. So I unrolled him again, and I took him a little farther out in the woods, and I chucked him. Guess what? A third time, he came back. This time, I took my little pine cone grabber, and I held him up. I, not very close, but I held him up. And if a snake's got an ear, I talked to him. I believe he probably heard me, because I said, now look. Three times you've come. And this will be the third time that I let you go. But if you, if you come back, tomorrow you're going to be graveyard dead. And I took him back out in the woods and I slung him out again. 
He must have heard me because he didn't come back. I don't like snakes. And the devil is nothing but a snake. That's all that he is, a snake, a serpent. So in Revelation 22, he's called, in Revelation 20, verse 2, he's called the serpent. In Genesis 4, 3, it was the serpent that beguiled Eve to eat the fruit that God told her that she wasn't to eat of. Isn't that just like a snake to cause you to do something that you wouldn't normally do? Isn't that just like the devil? In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verse number 3, he's called the tempter. And he'll do that. He'll tempt you. Uh, the Bible tells us that God doesn't want us to yield to temptation. God doesn't want us to fall into the snare of the devil's temptation. Now, did you notice all of those names that, that we gave to you that the Bible gives to the devil? Listen to me. Every one of the names given to him represents various facets of his personality and his strategies to come against you. Now a lot of people don't understand where the devil came from. Uh, I want you to know, and we don't have time to do an in-depth study on that, but I want you to know that the devil originated in heaven as a wise and beautiful angel. Now Isaiah tells us that his name was Lucifer. Now, the name Lucifer means son of the morning. He served in God's court, but he got very prideful. What happens whenever pride slips in? Pride comes before the fall. So he was a very prideful angel. And pride rose up in his heart and he purposed, some Bible scholars say that he purposed to become like God. This preacher says he purposed to become God. He didn't purpose to become like God. He purposed to become God. Now listen to me. A lot of people, whenever you ask the question, where did the first sin take place? Right away, somebody will say, over in the Garden of Eden. But actually, the first sin actually took place in heaven whenever Lucifer sinned against God and tried to become God. So Satan has a personality. And all of those names that we've given to you represent that personality. Oh. Uh, of all of them that I gave to you, there's one that I like to think sticks out above the other. Deceiver and tempter. But he is. In just a few moments, I'm going to show you that he's even called God. So bear with me. The second thing that I want you to see as we try to identify our enemy is Satan's position. Satan's position. Now, there are three positions that Satan feels at this present time. And I want to give you those three positions. Number one, the devil is a prince. The devil is a prince. Three times. At least three times in the scripture, he is called a prince. You'll find that in John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse number 31. You'll find it again in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse number 30. And you'll find it a third time in John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse number 11. Now, in Ephesians, chapter 2... Verse 2, he's also called the prince of the power of the air. 
the prince of the power of the air. Now, as the prince of this world, listen, as the prince of this world, the devil is in charge of evil men. As the prince of the power of the air, the devil is in charge of evil spirits. Did you catch that? As prince of the world, he is in charge of evil men. As prince of the power of the air, he is in charge of evil spirits. Now, Satan is in charge of evil, whether it be on earth or in heaven. Now, I know some of you are questioning probably in your mind right now. Preacher, I thought God cast him out of heaven. But he still has somewhat access to a portion of heaven. Can you prove that, preacher? Book of Job. He was walking to and fro. And he had an audience to with God. Now I didn't say that he was in the third heaven, but he had an audience with God. You see, there's more than one heaven. There's three. But he had an audience with God. There's a first heaven, second heaven, third heaven. The first heaven is our atmosphere. The second heaven is our space. The third heaven is the heaven that our God lives in. And that's going to be our home one day. He has power. Not in the third heaven but in the other two heavens. Now listen to me. Satan is in charge of evil, whether it be on earth or in heaven. He had an audience with God in the book of Job. And in the book of Job, we find that he talked to God and he said, why don't you take the hedge off of Job's life? That's Bible. That's not my word. That's God's word. God asked him, said, have you considered my servant Job? He said, yes, sir, I've considered him, but he said, you've got a hedge about him. God said, I'll take the hedge off, and he did. And God told Satan he could do with Job whatever he chose to do with Job. He could do anything you want to to him, but you can't take his life. And think about all the things that he did to Job. Took all his wealth, took his family, caused his wife to say, why don't you just curse God and die? Sores, boils, disease. But in all of that, Job said he knew that his Redeemer lived. So the devil is a prince. Number two, the devil is a ruler. He's a ruler. In 1 John chapter 5, verse number 19, the Bible tells us that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And you wondered why we're in such a mess in this country and in the world today? It's because the world lays under the sway of the wicked one. He is the ruler of the world system in which we live. Now, the world of power, he's a ruler of that. The world of lust, he's a ruler of that. The world of ambition, he's a ruler of that. The world of greed, he's a ruler of that. The world of lies, he's a ruler of that. You see, Satan's kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. But he is the ruler of his kingdom. So he's a prince. Secondly, he's a ruler. Thirdly, I told you a few minutes ago I was going to show you that the devil is a god. But always remember, lowercase g. Lowercase g. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul refers to the devil as the god of this age. The god of this age. With power to blind the minds of the unbelieving to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know why 
Many people don't ever accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior because the God, lowercase g, of this world has blinded their minds to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the devil's goal is to counterfeit everything that God does to lead astray the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a counterfeiter. Now, years ago, I watched George Burns' movie, Oh God, You Devil. Anybody ever saw that movie? George Burns made it popular. George Burns played God in the movie, but he also played the devil in the movie. And, and actually, I don't agree with some of the things that was in the movie, but you know what? There's a lot of truth to what that movie was saying. I mean, here's the devil who looks the same way that God looked, and here's God in a little simple bunch of clothes with a baseball cap on, and the devil flaunting his fancy duds, trying to be God, trying to be God, uppercase G. But you see, he can't do that. He tried that in heaven, and it didn't work, and he's still trying that. But he'll never be the God of the universe. So that's his position. He's a prince. He's a ruler. He's the God of this world. Not the God that created the world, but the God of this age. Number three, let's talk about Satan's power. We've talked about his position. Let's talk about his power. Now, this is the question that a lot of Christians ask or have about the devil. How powerful is the devil? Does the devil have the power to hurt us as well as harass us? Let me answer that question for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Listen to what it says. The devil works, his works are often accompanied by all power, all signs, and all wonders. So listen, our enemy has supernatural powers. He has supernatural powers. I remind you again of the story of the book of Acts where these gentlemen who had uh, watched Paul do wonders by casting demons out of individuals decided that they too was going to cast demons out. And so they found a demon-possessed man and said, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, I adjure you to come out of him. And the devil stood up and said, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But who are you? And it, well, hey, it did send them running as well, but he, the fellow caught up with them and he, they paid the price. Oh, Lord, he paid the price. Listen, don't ever make the mistake, as powerful as the enemy is, don't ever make the mistake of thinking that he has power to equal the power of God. Always remember, when you seem to be under a powerful attack at the hand of the supernatural devil, always remember what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse number 4. Always remember what it says, that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So you have power to overcome him. But your power to overcome his supernatural power is in the Christ that we love so much because he dwells within you. So we see his position. We see his power. And then the fourth thing that I want you to see is his purposes. 
Now there are many, there are many action verbs attached to the devil's activities in the scripture. I want us to look at three of these. Three of these. There are many more, but I'm going to look at three. Number one, he is the great deceiver. Jesus himself said he is the father of lies. Now in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, the devil is identified as the one who deceives the whole world. A lot of people wonder why we're in the mess that we're in. It's because we're living in deception. And listen, I'm not a politician. And I'm not here to preach about politicians. My goodness, i got to confess to you, I've had enough of politicians. I'm about sick of them. But there's one thing I want you to know. One of the reasons that our president and our vice president is under so much attack is because they invited the word of God back to the capital of the United States of America. And listen, it did not make the devil happy. And I'm not here telling you that Donald Trump is a perfect man or, my, or Pence is a perfect... None of us are perfect. None of us. But I'm telling you that's exactly what's going on in our country today as well as the world. The arch great deceiver has everybody wrapped up in deception trying to make what's wrong right and what's right wrong. He started sowing deception though long before our time. The devil started sowing deception in the Garden of Eden by taking the words of the living God that God spoke to Adam and Eve and twisting those words for himself. Did God truly tell you you could not eat of that fruit? God knew the day and the hour wherein you eat that fruit that you would be like God, knowing good and evil. And isn't it just like our human nature? Aren't we so gullible? Wow, I can be like God. Give me some of that fruit. And she did eat in her eyes were opened and then she took the deception that Satan had beguiled her to do to her husband and he did eat and don't you men look at me like you think it's all right a lot of you sitting there saying oh huh, it was the woman's fault he was given the responsibility to see over all of God's creation. So it was his responsibility to see over his wife. So, but you see, we've been playing the blame game ever since because we believe the great deceiver's lie. Here's Adam. God, you know that woman you gave me? It's her fault. She gave me the fruit and I did eat. And the woman said, oh, now, wait a minute, God. Said, it's not my fault. Said, that beautiful serpent that you created, it's his fault. And we've been blaming somebody ever since. Somebody's been blamed ever since. And it all boils down to the devil who started deception in the Garden of Eden. Now, the greatest defense, listen, the greatest defense against the deceiver is a knowledge of God's Word. How did Jesus overcome the deception of the deceiver? It is written. It is written. But I dare say, very few people know enough about this book to be able to overcome the deception of the evil one. So he is the deceiver. Number two, he is the great divider. You see, the first thing the devil did after rebelling against God was to divide the host of heaven into two camps, those who were with him and those who were with God. The devil is the author of division, and he continues to sow that in the body of Christ, in the church, through his lies, through jealousy, 
through pride, through power, and listen, even through money. Where two or three have gathered to worship, you better bet that that fourth one's going to show up sooner or later to try to cause division. He'll show up as an uninvited guest at any given moment. And then number three, he is the great destroyer. The devil uses two means to destroy people. Number one, he attempts to destroy us through adversity. Adversity is one's life being filled with discouragement. Number two, he attempts to destroy us by direct attack, shooting those fiery darts. Now listen to me. Identify your enemy and go to war with your enemy, but suited up in the whole armor of God. The devil's ultimate goal is to make God look bad. So while he attacks, or while he's attacked rather, often at us, they're ultimately directed at God. As I close this little study session this evening, the great religious reformer, Martin Luther, was a lover of music. Did you know that? Martin Luther was a lover of music. But he had a great understanding of spiritual warfare. And because of this wonderful man of God, who understood spiritual warfare, it caused him to sit down and to pen the words to a beautiful song. A mighty fortress is our God. Anybody ever heard that song? A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never falling, our helper. He amid the floods of moral ills prevail. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. And armed with cruel hate, on the earth is not his equal. And though this world the devil's field should threaten to us, or threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his triumph through us. A mighty fortress is. One of the most important things that you can do as a child of God is to know that you are in a battle. You are in a war. And Satan truly as a roaring lion walketh about seeking those in whom he may devour. Jesus said he's came to steal, to kill, and to, to destroy. And he'll do it. If you let him. Don't give him that kind of power. Because he'll take it. If you give him the power to kill you. He'll kill you. But he don't have that power. Unless you give it to him. Jesus said he's come to steal. To kill and to destroy. But I've come that you might have life. And that you might have it. More abundantly. I've introduced you to your enemy. In the next few weeks, I'm going to introduce you to the armor your God has provided for you to overcome your enemy. Stand with me. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for letting us see who our adversary, our enemy is our deceiver, our tempter, and the list could go on and on, really is. And give us your power to overcome his power. For greater is he that's within me than he that's in the world. Help us search our heart. Examine ourselves. 
just to see where we are and if we need to do business with the King of Kings at an altar of prayer, help us to do so in Jesus' name.